Well, thank y'all so much for being here this afternoon. Uh, many of you know Ken is, was a long time. I know him as Ken. I know some people refer to him as Ivy. I have always was introduced to him as Ken, but, um, but he's been, was, I think, 40 years a member here at Bethel Baptist Church, and he has served in so many different capacities. A lot of his friends uh, have gone on to be with the Lord ahead of him, uh, but it didn't matter what age you were. Y'all, you all know he made a tremendous, tremendous impact on a lot of different people. So today we want to honor him, and I just want to thank you on behalf of the family for being here. Before we get started, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most kind and gracious Father, we thank you, and we praise you, Lord, for examples like Ken, who served always serve willing and always just serving behind the scenes, always doing what um, he felt like you wanted him to do. And God, we, we're here to celebrate him today. And Lord, we want to celebrate him uh, in light of his faith because of everything he did was because of you. And God, I just uh, pray, Lord, that you help us today as we as we honor him, as we celebrate some things in his life that meant so much to all of us. And God, we just want to be careful that you get the praise and you get the glory for my brother's life. So God, be with us as we celebrate him today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. This time I'm going to ask Brother Todd if he'll come on up and, and share. I guess the first thing I'd like to do uh, before I get started is to acknowledge, um, first of all, um, this, this is perfect. If I could draw anything up, I would say I wanted to have the service here at Bethel because for my dad, church was his life. I was struggling a little bit uh, when I was thinking about, about his life, and I was like, you know, what did my dad really like? What, you know, did he go out to dinner a lot? Did you, you know, he didn't do anything like that. I would say that the church newsletter was his social calendar. Um, and that's been that way ever since, ever since I've known him. Um, so I, I, I just think he would love the fact that it was here. He would love the fact that you guys fed us before um, and um, I also want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for staying with him. Even during the last weeks, some of you that came to visit him kind of realized he, he lost some of his cognitive abilities. He could be a little cranky, and he did not want to be in the nursing home, which I don't blame him. But thank you for your patience and your grace with that. Um, I want to thank Hilton um, because I know in today's times some people want to be a pastor but not a shepherd, and you were both. So thank you for that. It meant so much to him that you came and saw him. I, I walked in one day while Hilton was there, and even though my dad didn't, couldn't communicate very well, I could see the respect and the reverence that was behind his eyes. So I really appreciate that. Um, I'm very thankful that my brother Steve is here. <clears throat> He's my brother from another mother. I don't know. Uh, but I do, I do know we have the same father. Amen. Amen. Um, Steve is, is an important part of Debbie and I's life. Um, we sing with some of his choirs. And as you guys, and I'll share this a little later, this bothered me a little bit. Um, my father loved music. And I'll share with you a little later a story that, uh, that we shared together with him. But um, it was interesting. You know, my father was a little stoic and didn't talk a lot about his past and things. But um, 
I guess one day I was sharing with him that Debbie and I were going to be singing with Steve and the Roanoke Voices. And he goes, you know, I sang with Steve one time. And I said, really? You sang with Steve? I didn't know that. He goes, yeah, he took us to Morningstar to sing with the choir. And he said we were good, but we didn't know how to swing. (laughs) And I said, Dad, it's called Sway, and don't worry, your son has it. I've got it down now, okay? But uh, my my dad loved music. I also want to acknowledge some people that that aren't here today. Um, His sister, Ann, who is only a year younger than my dad, and over the last seven weeks while he's been really sick, she's, she's called a lot. And she would, she's a great storyteller. So I learned a lot about my dad. But one of the things I learned was they were thick as thieves when they were, they were little. So that was her playmate. And um, she desperately wanted to be here, but you know, in typical Stafford fashion, she's a caretaker right now for her husband, so she couldn't come. One of his favorite nieces, Rose, um, I want to acknowledge her too. I know she couldn't be here. She's all the way down in Texas and has a lot of obligations there. I would like to thank Dan and Donna for coming up. They are representing the whole Stafford clan that, that couldn't be here. Uh, Dan is, is uh, my dad's nephew. It's his youngest sister's son and, and his wife. Um, so I'm glad that they're here. I got this. Not the eulogy part, but I, I want to th- frame the, my, this speech and my talk a little bit about I got this because I think when, about my dad, that was his theme. I got this. During his early years, he kind of had to have it. Um, most of you are, may have known that my dad was a PK. For those of you who don't go to church a lot, that means he was a preacher's kid. And as most of you may know or may not know, I think Hilton's a preacher's kid too, so I gotta be careful here. Most preacher's kids rebel. Now my father didn't talk a lot about his past, but I did hear some stories. And the real jewel is my aunt sent me a book. Sent me a book. My dad grew up in Bowie's Creek and one of his friends, in fact, it says in here, he had a note from him. This was his best friend, um, barefoot in Bowie's Creek and beyond. So not only do I know he was a PK, I have written evidence. There's a chapter called Our Youth in Bowie's Creek. And I will tell you that uh, my aunt shared that my dad used to get his mouth washed out when he said the word dang, and there was a few more D words that were quoted to my dad in here. So um, I'm gonna say that he was a true preacher's kid, but he had to get it because he wasn't a preacher's kid very long. Um, I kind of did the math the other day. My dad didn't talk a lot about his father, but he died when he was 31, the year I was born. And my aunt told me that He had gotten Parkinson's 10 years before that. So in a family with his mother and three sisters, two nieces, he kind of had to become the man of the family early on. He had to become the patriarch of the family. And I think he took that role very seriously and he took it well. Um, I think a lot of that kind of may have shaped his life in a lot of ways. Again, he didn't talk a lot about his father until my mother died. Um, I think my cousin Dan and I were talking, men do not do well when they're widowers. Uh, Just a public service announcement to you women out there, we don't do it as well. And my father, after my mother died, um, became a faucet of information. He never used to talk, and all of a sudden he could talk an hour on the phone or he could talk an hour um, when we were with him. But one of the things he shared with me in a rare time where he was kind of vulnerable was he said those early experiences were tough for him because his father was a Baptist minister. They were driving to rural churches, and by that time his father couldn't drive anymore because of the Parkinson's, but he would still go preach. And my father had to drive him. And, you know, for somebody that young... 
that could really shake your faith if you weren't careful. But my father stayed true to his faith and he became the man of the house and he took care of his mom, both financially um, and also he became the ultimate fix-it man for the house. Um, and those of you who have probably been around my dad, my dad loved projects. Um, at my grandmother's house, there was never a trip where he didn't have some kind of project to do. When he went to see his in-laws, my theory is he kind of created some projects because maybe he didn't want to be around the in-laws that much, but uh, I'll, I'll just have to speculate on that. But um, for, his, for his mother, later on for, his, for one of his nieces and, and his sister, he became a very important person and he had to get it early on. I'll call this, I got this my early years, my childhood years. Have I told you that my dad could fix anything? Sounds great until you're around seven or eight years old and the big color console TV in the living room breaks and it's the only TV in the house. So most people would say, I'm gonna call a TV repairman or I'm gonna go get a new one. But dad decided to take it apart component by component, piece by piece, lay it all in the floor. And that process probably took a week. And then I think he finally diagnosed the issue, which means there was another two weeks to order the part and get it in and then put it all back together. So, you know, there was, there was a time where I wanted to say, Dad, just buy a new one. Um, I remember when I got my first car um, and I was driving it to college, it was an old beat up Subaru front wheel drive thing. And, you know, at some point in college, I remember letting out on the clutch and the wheel, I just heard this sound in there. I was like, uh-oh, car didn't move. So my dad got it towed back to Roanoke and I was kind of hoping, okay, maybe dad will help me buy a new car or something. No, my dad was gonna fix it. So we went to the junkyard, found a part, spent three days in the driveway so we could fix it. And when I say we, it was really him because I learned early on my job during the projects were to just nod my head and, and you know, kind of acknowledge when he grumbled about something. Um, later on, it happened on the other side. I thought, wow, I'm gonna get a new car now. Dad's gonna help me out. No, we are back to the junkyard. My dad was, and I got this type of person. Dishwashers, roof replacements. Who replaces their own roof? My dad did. My brother and I had to carry shingles up the ladder for him so he could, could do the roof. Um, you name it. I remember my glasses. My glasses would break. My dad would pull out the soldering iron. We're not going to get a new pair of glasses. I'm going to fix them. Um, I got this applied to about everything, and it also applied to leadership positions. When I was in elementary school, they needed an elementary school PTA president. My dad did it. I have no idea why my dad was a PTA president, but somebody needed one, so he did it. At church, he was the deacon, he was the deacon chair, he was the personnel chair, he was a Sunday school teacher, he was a Sunday school superintendent. I got this. If my dad was asked, particularly by the church, he served and he had it. Some of the people may say that my dad may have had a little bit of smartest man in the room about him. Some people that work with me may say that apple doesn't fall far from the tree, but let's not say that right now. But my dad, he was a smart man. In addition to being a pastor, his father was a math teacher. And my aunt told me uh, on the phone um, the other week that whenever she would get a problem that she couldn't solve in math, she would go ask her math teacher and he would just say, go ask your dad. So he was a smart man. Um, and looking through some of my dad's old annuals and stuff, he was always in the mirror as the most studious. So he knew what he was doing. And uh, it's interesting, I didn't really know that many people that worked with my father at GE where he worked all the time, but Marshall Paul, is Marshall? There he is. It was interesting, he came by the nursing home 
And he said that he worked with my dad, G. And I was like, Marshall, did my dad know everything like he seemed to do at home? He goes, I never told your dad he was wrong. And that's all he would say. That's all he said. He was very gracious about it, but I can only imagine. Um, my dad would have told him, I got this. Um, later on, um, I think my brother and my sister would agree with this. Dad's greatest gift and his strength as a parent was when we were in trouble. Your kids screw up in life. Um, I screwed up, Frank screwed up, my sister screwed up. Um, and whenever that happened, he was really great, whether it was financially, solving our problems, fixing our messes, whatever it took. And from my perspective, he did it without judgment or condemnation. When I went through my divorce, um, one of the toughest conversations I knew that I was going to have and I was scared of was telling my parents. And I'll never forget how my dad was so supportive, so supportive. Didn't give me a lecture, no judgment, nothing but support. I remember teaching in one of my Sunday school classes a class on parenting, and I don't remember all of it, but one, two of the things that stood out to me were Parents should make a safe environment for their kids so that when they're home, they had a place to get away from bullying, um, having to be somebody they weren't, or peer pressure. And the other one was why people miss their parents so much when they die. And the reason you miss your parents so much when they die is because they're the ones who are always in your corner. Thank you, Mom and Dad, for that. <clears throat> I got this, the women in his life. That makes me snicker when I say that. Um, the women in his life. Um, I do think if my dad had one weakness, it was helping people. It was helping other women, particularly widows. Um, I would even apply that to my mother. I think a lot of you here... Um, knew my mother very well. Uh, my mother was, was sweet, she was a saint, she was funny, she was humorous, um, and she had a remarkable innocence about her that was so refreshing, and she had a faith that was so simple and I coveted so much, um, even to the day she died. She just had this sweet little faith. But she wasn't necessarily great at finances, navigating life, whatever. And my dad said, I got this. And so I think God made a perfect match between the two because he helped her navigate and gave her the good, stable life that she enjoyed. And she provided the ear for him to grumble at times. Um, and also I think she steered him to the other side of life, the fun, the family gatherings, and the humor. The women in the neighborhood, um, one of the cool things that happened uh, when we were doing the visitation is the somebody I hadn't seen forever, uh, it was Brian Beveridge came in to pay his condolences and he lived in the house right behind us and he just told me how much my dad did for his parents um, when they both got really ill, and he was very grateful. And that was, that was my father. He was the neighborhood guy who took care of people. Um, the first one I remember when I was 10, there was this creepy old lady that lived at the end of the street. You know, as kids, those are the ones when you ride your bike up there, and the house, there's this old house back there, there's this little old lady, and we all determined that she was a mean old lady. Well, somehow my dad befriended her. It was probably my mom who introduced him. But anyway, all of a sudden, my brother and I were helping mow her grass. My dad was doing things for her. And she was the one who allowed him to garden there in the plot of land that was up there near her. And um, told Alan they did a great job putting vegetables in there because that was one of my dad's passions. For over 50 years, he, he uh, used that plot of land the garden, but over the years, um, he did everything for, for Miss London. I mean, up until the time she died, he helped her with her finances, her estate, he kept her buildings up. 
The other one that I remember the most was my mother's best friend who was widowed at a fairly young age. Um, and um, she was my mom's best friend, but my dad kind of filled the gap um, for everything else for her. Again, he would mow her grass, uh, shovel her driveway when it snowed, um, even up until his 70s. He was still out there doing those kind of things. And in the end, he even helped her with her estate and her finances and continued to visit her in the nursing home up until the time she died a year or so ago. So that was, my dad would say, I got this for the people in the neighborhood. His niece, Rose. Rose was special to my dad. Maybe it was because she stayed in the house up until the time and cared for his mother until she died. Maybe it was because she kind of had the same stubborn, independent, but caring demeanor about her. Or maybe it was because of circumstances she was stranded, basically stranded in Texas, all alone without family. Um, my dad would call her all the time. My dad would send money to her. Um, that was his thing. He liked to rescue people. The final one I'll mention, this one's going to be tough for me, um, is the woman that, was it the woman he married? It was the woman I married. I tell her that she may be the one person that I know my dad never had an angry word with or a cross conversation with. And I think it's because she broke him. Um, and I don't know if you know my wife, but she hugged him more than probably he's ever been hugged. She kissed him on the cheek and she called him dad from the first day that they met. Um, <clears throat> And I'll also tell you, this is one of the, the neat God things, I think, that one of the things that Debbie and I share together. We both got to see the best of each other's dads. Before Debbie and I got married, I only got to go see him one time. We weren't even engaged. And Debbie's father, he was, he was a native Colombian who came over and immigrated, became a U.S. citizen, loved the United States. Um, but he sounded like Ricky Ricardo. So I'll never forget the first time I went up there, we weren't even engaged yet, we were just dating. And I went with him to all the little places in Vineland, New Jersey. It was the butcher, we went here, we went there, and everywhere he went, he would say, this is top. He couldn't say my word, he called me top. And when he introduced me, he would say, we hope that he will soon be our son-in-law. I can't do a good Ricky Ricardo, but he introduced me to everybody he knew and would immediately say, we hope that he's our future son-in-law. I don't know why he said that, but he, he liked me. And so Debbie and I have that thing in common. Now we both saw the best of each other's fathers. And the one thing, I didn't know this until recently, but at our wedding, my father-in-law met my dad for the first time. And the one thing he asked my dad was to watch out for his youngest daughter. And maybe it was because he knew what we didn't know, and that was his cancer was back and his time was short, and it was but he wanted to know that when he traveled back to New Jersey, his youngest daughter was gonna be taken care of. And my dad said, I got this. <sighs> my dad may have shared with you, but you know, we went through a pretty big health scare about four years ago. Uh, one of those life altering things for Debbie, she was really sick. And God graciously moved that out of that. But during that time, my dad was a rock. He was a rock. He was a prayer warrior like I've never seen him. And he was there for us in the darkest of times. And that really, really meant a lot to me. I couldn't stand up here and do this. And my dad would probably be mad I was standing up here and I'm doing this anyway. But um, 
I couldn't stand up here and do this without saying one more thing. My dad knew the gospel. <clears throat> I heard Tim Keller once say that in most religions, when your life is over, you go meet your deity, your God, whatever, and you present what you've done in life. And if my father did that, I think he would have a lot to show for it. But Christianity stands alone as a religion that says, what you did means nothing. And my dad knew that. Um, I think dad's life was built around, I got this, but he also knew that his salvation was there because Jesus came and lived the life, the perfect life that my dad couldn't live. And he said, I got this. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own. It is a gift from God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So one of the things I love about that, as much as my dad did all these works, he knew he did nothing. God laid it out in front of him and he did it. Um, I think a lot of us like to think about going to the pearly gates and whether you get in or not. Uh, I, I thought, to, you know, my dad, if he went there, he would probably have a big stack of works lined up behind him. But he knew it wasn't what he did, it was what Jesus did. And scripture tells us that when God looks at us now, he doesn't see our ugly sin. He doesn't see our ugly side. He sees Jesus. And I think if my dad was at the pearly gates, he would have said, it's not my works, I'm with him. And I think that's what he knows got him in. Um, I know many of you know that the last few years with my dad were difficult because his mind and his body didn't allow him what he, didn't allow him to do what he loved the most working for the church, working for others, working in his garden. He had to lean on a lot of people. Um, he had to lean on my brother. Um, he had to lean on my brother for help from around the house to help cook. My sister became my mom's, my mom's ear for him. And he needed to talk to her about his health, his worries, his complaints, and at times his loneliness. She was his plus one on some of the senior trips I know you guys took here at the church. Both of these are thankless jobs and they have my appreciation and gratitude. Near the end, he struggled to find, uh, to find joy in things. And I remember when we were, he was in the nursing home, we said, I was saying, wow, you know, Debbie would say, what brings your dad joy? And I was like, well, gardening, can't do that, can't go to church right now. So we were really struggling with it. And we only found one. My dad loved to sing. He loved to sing in choirs. He loved to sing by himself. And he'd usually sing very loud. He was that guy when we go to church and visit somewhere and they would start singing hymns. I was like, Dad, turn it down a bit. I remember at Phil, your, your dad's funeral, um, when they sang Amazing Grace under that tent, I could hear my dad and he was so loud that the person leading the service afterwards came up to him and said, wow, you got a good voice. He just liked to sing loud when he sang. So... During his stay at the nursing home, uh, one of Joan's friends, Bonnie, uh, got, got some musicians to come in there and sing with him. Um, and later on, Steve, who's here with us today, uh, came by and sang with him. And those times were really, really special. Um, the last time Steve came, it was about six days before he passed. His communication skills were not good. He was on some anti-agitation drugs and they'd just given him some right before Steve came. But, you know, when Steve came in the room, I said, do you know who this guy is? And he immediately recognized me, he said, that's Steve. And so we sang 
some, some old hymns, which my father loved, um, and sang old hymns. And despite not being able to communicate all day, despite being on the drugs, my dad mouthed or sang every word. In fact, we marveled. He knew the words better than we did, um, which was really, really special. Um, I think... I think one of the things I would say is um, I do believe that God planted a chip in all of us that makes music touch our hearts. Um, whether you like gospel music, whatever it might be, Bruce Springsteen or whatever, I truly believe that music has a place in our hearts and God uses that to remind us of scripture, to remind us of promises. Um, gosh, I looked you go all the way back to the Old Testament in Deuteronomy when God's telling Moses to tell the people, you know, they're going to go into the land and they're going to screw it up. Um, so he gives them all these instructions and he knows they're going to fail. One of the things he tells Moses is tell them to write it down in a song so they'll remember it. So um, my dad loved music. It moved him, um, especially gospel music. And in honor of that, I kind of once like Steve to come up and lead us in a medley here of some of those old hymns. And in honor of my father, you guys need to sing loud. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jesus, I'm afraid. 
Not a whole lot I can add to that. We had church, amen? There's a lot of things I had wrote down. I'm actually, uh, I'm not going to say it, except there's a few things that, that I feel like it's important to, to mention about Ken. Uh, Todd did a fantastic job of sharing his life and sharing some qualities, but I think we can all agree that everything we've heard so far about Ken and seen for ourselves experience for ourselves, we have seen the fruit of the Spirit in his life. Amen? Love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, goodness, kindness, patience, self-control. He exuded that in so many different ways. As it's already been mentioned, Ken's a pastor's son. I'm a pastor's son, too. Of course, my dad's with the Lord now, but um, uh, that's one of the things I discovered early on, 17 years ago, when I got to know Ken a little bit better, that we have some common ground, and we shared a few stories, and he shared about his dad and, and him preaching at actually several churches, several smaller churches, which I had to be a lot more stressful than preaching at one church. I, I don't care what size the church, but if you have to preach two or three times at two or three different churches, I can imagine how physically exhausting that must have been for his dad. But, um, but also, more than likely, because of his dad's work ethic, Ken, uh, learned so much from his dad, from his parents, and we all know, as it's already been shared, and we've already witnessed that Ken had a tremendous work ethic. He loved to work, and he worked hard at anything that he did, whether it be his garden or here at the church. He showed up for everything. I mean, if we had something that needed to be done, he was here. In fact, it hasn't been too long ago we was actually taking all the pews out and putting these chairs in. He was here. Probably shouldn't have been here, but he was here. He had a, a back brace put on, and he was just going to work. It was amazing to watch him and his faithfulness, and he did it with joy. He didn't just do it and grunt and complain about it. He did it with joy. He enjoyed every single moment. I remember one time we had a cleanup day years ago, and he was here, and uh, at that time, he was a little bit healthier. He was out working me. Um, but uh, I, just, I just feel so blessed to be able to get to know Ken. You know, Ken, I'm sure had, I was telling Todd, I'm sure Ken had opinions about things. I'm sure there are things that we've done in the past 17 years since I've been here that he may not have 100% agreed with, but he wasn't one to just harp on anything. He would just move on. If he didn't like it or did like it, I mean, he would move on and work at it and keep at it and do whatever God wants him to do. He was always, always willing to serve. And I don't think he ever said no to much of anything. If he felt like he can do it like my brother said, he'd say, I, I've got this. Um, traditions were important to him, and I think Todd had mentioned that. And in fact, one of the things that wasn't mentioned I thought was really cool because it sounded a lot like my, my mom is that he saved money every time he got paid to put the 
put back for Christmas because he wanted to make sure that he gave good Christmas gifts to his family. He was generous. Uh, he was really wanted to make sure that the church received the offerings. In fact, he got a little frustrated a while back because he was trying to get things straight at the bank and he, was, uh, he wasn't able to write checks like he used to. His handwriting was, was kind of hard to read sometimes, so he would come here and talk to Dana and try to get things straight. So he, he wanted to make sure that the church received his tithes and his offerings, and he was so faithful to give. Uh, understand, too, you were talking about a fix. I got kind of tickled when they were talking about this tiller that he had for many years, and the only thing he ever did with it was replace a motor, but he never bought a new one. But he always, I mean, he got his money's worth out of that tiller. But he loved this church. He, he loved people. He loved being around people. He loved going places with people. He loved studying the Bible. He kept a lot of notes. Understand the family found a whole lot of notes that he would keep, and he just loved to learn more about the Lord. Um, if anything or anyone needed something and he knew about it, he was always going to try to make sure it was done. I can remember in the early years uh, as Ken was serving in different capacities, whether it be a deacon or on a committee and so forth, um, he was a planner. Uh, he was talking about how he um, uh, maybe carried himself as being the smartest man in the room. I, don't really, I didn't really see him actually... Uh, carrying himself that way. I'm sure maybe he felt that way from time to time, but I believe with all my heart as he was saying that, that there were many meetings I've been in when he was the smartest man in the room. <laughs> but he was one of those that if he didn't have anything to say, he wasn't going to say it, but when he did have something to say, you listened. But you know, I, like I said earlier, with, the, with his expressions of the fruit of the Spirit, um, he knew what it was like to have an ongoing relationship with Jesus Christ. He wasn't just religious. He didn't just show up because it was the right thing to do. He showed up because he had a sincere desire to be here, to serve, to love people, and to care for the things that God cared about. A long time ago, you know, Ken made a decision that he was going to come to faith in Jesus. And he was determined that he was going to serve Jesus for the rest of his life. But you know, I, I can't help to think, as Todd was sharing earlier, about the grace of God. If it wasn't for God's grace, there's none of us, none of us would ever get to see or experience heaven or the presence of the Lord. And I love that Jesus gave these words of comfort, and I find these words still comforting, especially in days like this in John 14. He told his disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in, my, in, in me. My, in my Father's house, Jesus says, there are many, King James says, mansions, translation, dwelling places. Let me just put it this way. Whatever our place is like in heaven, it's going to make the biggest mansion here on earth look like a shack. Because to be in the presence of Jesus, I cannot imagine what that dwelling place must be like. But I think what's going to matter more than anything else is the next words Jesus said. Where I am, there you may be also. I think that's what's going to matter more than anything else is that we get to be in the presence of Jesus for all of eternity. To serve with, not just to stand and, and worship. Well, that's going to be a part of it, but he's going to give us a task. He's going to give us a job. He's going to give us something to do that's going to really make a difference. And I imagine Ken's one of those that, man, I'm ready for that job. Give me that job. You know, it's interesting. In, in Genesis God gave Adam a job before, first of all, before he gave him a woman, and second of all, <laughs> before sin entered the world. You see, working is not a part of the fall. It's a blessing to be productive, to be creative, to do. And God's going to give us something. He, said, he tells us, as we come into his presence, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Now I give you the responsibility over many things. He's going to give us a job. And I guarantee you right now, Ken's enjoying his job. He's enjoying the presence of Jesus. 
And we also know that one day all of us who are in Christ will receive a glorified eternal body. Where this old body we walk in right now will no longer be of any use, but we'll be given a body that will live forever, last forever, not grow old, not wear out. But we have a promise that we're not only going to be given a job, but we're going to give them a body that can handle anything. We get to enjoy the presence of Jesus and the job He gives us. And I promise you this, Ken is probably going to be one of those that's going to try to outdo us all. He's going to work. He's going to continue to work. And we're all going to get to enjoy being in the presence of of Jesus, because I think when it's all said and done, that's going to be the most important thing to happen to all of us. Can you imagine what it's going to be like? Not so much about how beautiful heaven is, because, you know, John, the Apostle John in Revelation, he, you could almost sense the frustration as he's describing heaven, as he describes even the New Jerusalem. He says it's like this or as this. He's trying to use human knowledge to describe what he was seeing that mankind cannot see right now. And he was falling short of describing the beauty of heaven. As beautiful and as wonderful heaven must be, I think what's going to matter more than anything else, we're going to be so enthralled about being in the presence of Jesus that the place we're at may not seem like a big deal. But we get to be with Jesus. I believe the only one in heaven, the only one in heaven that's going to have physical scars is Jesus. We're going to see throughout all eternity, be reminded throughout all eternity of what He did for us as we look at His nail-scarred hands his pierced side, his feet, as we watch him, as we praise him, as we worship him, we'll see those scars. And we'll be reminded every day throughout all eternity that we get to be with him, not because we deserve it, but because of what Jesus did for us. That's what Ken wants you to know more than anything else. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I believe if Ken was here today, he would beg you, especially after he has seen what he has seen, he would beg you, please surrender your life to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for the life of a man who cared so deeply and was an example to so many people. God, I thank you, Lord, for his life. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do even in the days and months ahead as you'll continue to remind every person here of what Ken said and what Ken did and how it mattered. In Jesus' name, one of his favorite songs. Uh, we're going to close with this song, I'll Fly Away. A few things that I wanted to say when I got up here the first time, I'd say, well, just like when my hair left me, sometimes my memory leaves me as well. Um, Todd, Debbie, they know that Linda and I love you. You know that. I just wanted to make it public so I can't take it back then. But we love you. We have been praying for you and we'll continue to pray for you. Frank, Joan, Jordan, family, we'll continue to pray for you. The last time I was here, I mentioned to you earlier that it was around the mid-90s, late-90s. It was red carpet. Was it red or burgundy carpet and burgundy pews? And so it's not been long since you pulled that up? A few years? Okay, okay. Well, praise God. So good to be with you. Some glad morning when this life is over.
At this time, we're going to conclude the service at the cemetery.